So I'm very, very pleased to introduce Amy Erickson. I can see that in the chat, um, the, fan, the fan base is here. There's a big Amy fan over here, big Amy fan, the best teacher ever. So that's a nice welcome uh, for her. Um, just a little background, Amy is a representational oil painter. She's one of the uh, most decorated uh, winningest painters in the plein air world. Um, she was born in Paris in 1967 and raised in Sunnyvale, California and started painting at the age of eight. Um, she teaches painting, drawing, color theory. Uh, she has a particular interest in uh, what enables or inhibits artistic progress uh, and how we learn to see what we cannot see and how expectations influence our ability to perceive. We are very privileged to be able to hear about her personal art journey today and learn from her experience uh, how to find our purpose and voice in our art. Thank you, Amy, please. Thank you, Deb. I'm getting my slides set up. Okay. I got this feeling inside my bones. It goes electric, wavy, when I turn it on. All through my city, all through my home. We're flying up, no ceiling when we in our zone. I got that sunshine in my pocket. Got that good soul in my feet. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I am delighted to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of your um, a part of your conference. I um, I think it's just wonderful that you have such a large and active group. Um, I think it's a wonderful way to be supportive of your own. Um, artistic practice. So um, my topic for today is the inner world, finding one's voice. Um, as Deb mentioned, um, it, one thing that I, I think matters a lot in this topic is the difference between the outer world and the inner world. Um, one of my teachers said to me at one point, there are two parts to having an artistic career. The first one is to get really good. And the second one is to put yourself out there. And that was one of the landmarks on my, my own journey was that like, it was something that really resonated for me that, that just automatically made sense. And there have been lots and lots of other things that teachers have said to me that made no sense what to whatsoever and didn't stick. And I have paid no attention to them. Um, but I chose um, this image, um, this image, <laughs> as it, to represent like leaving the inner world and going into the outer world. Because that's what we do when we take our art, which is so personal, and take it into the marketplace or out into the world to be viewed by other people. <clears throat> so as, as Deb mentioned, I, I did start um, oil painting when I was really little. Um, one second. Um, here I am in 1971 in kindergarten and you can, um, that's me in the red tights holding my beautiful artwork. I think I can get a little bit better resolution so you can see, yeah, how good I was when I was like five. And um, um, I, I can, I think I can, even though you're all muted, I think I can hear your laughter echoing over the internet. Um, but in like, this is, so I did start oil painting when I was really quite little. Um, partly because my mom, like if I expressed an interest in anything, she would, and this was true for my four siblings as well. She would just sign us up for lessons in anything. So this is me in 1982. I still have, most of these paintings, um, they are terrible. Um, but I have to say, I am so, so grateful that oil paint has pretty much always been a part of my experience. It, I don't ever remember it being new to me. Like I basically went from crayons and markers right into oil paint during that time in my life when I was experiencing lots of new things. And so 
oil paint and the smell of linseed oil has just has always been a part of who I am. Um, so the artistic journey, I, I, I'm, I wanna make a, a correlation to a literal journey. Um, I, there was a point in my life where I um, became really stuck and um, I needed a change and not artistically, just life in general. So there, I think this is a parallel that does apply um, to our artistic journeys as well. And, and I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to make a distinction between two types of journey that aren't necessarily independent from one another. One of them is a planned journey that has a map and um, an itinerary, maybe even a guide. And um, so that's what this trip was. This is a bicycle trip that I took in 2003 because I knew I needed to facilitate change in my life. And I wanted to take myself outside of the context of my life so that I could see who I was outside of all the things that I did on a daily basis. So this was the, this is the route that we followed from San Diego to St. Augustine and it's like 3,300 miles. Um, the second type of journey is the intuitive journey where um, you need an adventurous spirit, you need curiosity and confidence, and most of all, you need the ability to wander off and become immersed. And like I said, these two types of journeys can happen at the same time. Like you can be a, a you can be on a planned journey with a map and a guide and you can still have the experience of wandering off and becoming immersed. But th this second type of journey is one that is very natural to us as children and that we can often lose the ability to do this as we become adults. We, we get better and better at following directions um, and staying on the path and staying inside the lines. But the, the inner journey is most correlated with wandering off and becoming immersed. And the inner, the inner journey, the, the, the inner world is where your own voice emerges from. So for me, this, this, this trip was um, exactly what I needed. And um, even though I, I couldn't have known that going into it, just seemed like the best idea. Um, and follow, so uh, what, I, what I had decided to do was take six months and um, leave my life. Uh, this trip took two months. I also went to New York City and took a um, class at the Art Students League for a month. And then I went to Italy and took a class at the Florence Academy of Art. And um, this was the first time that I undertook like a serious plein air practice because it was a plein air painting class. I thought, I don't want to go to Italy and spend every day, all day inside of a darkened studio. So here I am on my rented bicycle with my French easel strapped to the back of the bike um, off to whatever painting location for the day. It was a great adventure. And the, the whole journey really, what happened for me was changes happened that I couldn't have just decided to make. Um, certain things that didn't really belong to me just fell away that I, that I had adopted. They just they just went away. So at the end of this trip, I had um, much more internal freedom. And I think that in painting, there are, there are a couple of things that we need in order to make a good painting. We need skill. We also need internal freedom to make decisions. Um, so one practice that we can adopt for ourselves is to ask ourselves like, when do I have freedom to make decisions? And when do I feel restricted? 
And when you feel that restriction to see if, find ways to find a little bit more space right there. So um, my continuing with my plein air journey, these are the two paintings that I did in Carmel in 2013, uh, the competition pieces. And Carmel was my first, it was my second plein air competition, but it was my first big plein air competition. And this is, this is really that moment for me where I, where I left the safety and sanctity of my inner world and really went into the outer world. Um, and I did it by telling myself that it was just for fun and it would be fun to meet a bunch of different painters. And then I, I looked at the list and it was people who were famous. And um, I, in my mind, I just kind of, you know, I, those, it was people who I respect a lot and I um, was excited to meet. But in my mind, I wasn't really competing with them because I couldn't handle like that. I, to, in my mind, I was not on that level. Um, so what happened in, what happened this year in Carmel was that I like, they, I, I won, I won best of show. I won, I won a whole bunch of ribbons and um, it, it created this enormous shock like shocked my system of if I'm in a show with all these other people and I just want it, I have to completely reassess my perception of who I am as a painter because um, I'm I I was totally unprepared for that to happen. So, um, and after that, I entered a lot of different plein air competitions and my my. I think I maintained my, it, it, it's a clash. Like it's a clash between like my own personal comfort and like that, that interior comfortable world where I can sing as loud as I want. And then going into this place where there's, you know, it's the world of commerce. There's, for me, it was not an easy transition. Um, this is, so a, a little bit about my way, the way that I work. Um, <clears throat> Um, and recognizing this for me was very useful because it, um, it enabled me to keep the things that really matter to me. Um, I'm kind of a backdoor painter. Um, I, I never tell myself that I have to paint. Um, like I, if there's a schedule, I may or may not stick to it. So this um, image that I'm showing you now was from um, the Olmsted plein air event. But it was at the end of the day when we were done painting for the day and they were just having a dinner for the artists, but it was in this really great place where there were lights hung up and you know I had an idea for my painting and everyone was like, Amy, you're gonna paint? And I was like, yeah, I have an idea. So it didn't, um, the, you know, I think, it, I think in my world, it's like, if I have an idea for a painting, nothing else matters. Like that, that's what I'm gonna do. So here's the finished painting. Um, which was, oh, look, there's a blue ribbon on it, right? Um, so, so I, I guess like for me, it's just like, I don't want to be in a box too much. I, I, I want, I want my inner, my inner world to be big enough to encompass what's also going on in the outer world. And I think that, um, becoming oneself and finding your voice is, is partly, um, having a filter that recognizes what is truly you and what really isn't. Some landmarks on, along the way. I mentioned this earlier. The landmarks for me are things that you recognize. It might be artwork. It might be words. Um, 
but it's something that resonates for you. And um, it, these, these things help you find your way because they are markers. You could be in a room with a hundred people and hear something that didn't resonate for anybody else. But if it resonates for you, then it's for you. And it means that it's a marker for you on your way. So it helps you know yourself better. Here's some of my landmarks. <clears throat> uh, Bert Silverman. And he, he is the teacher who said to me that an art career has two parts, getting really good and putting yourself out there. And I, when he said it, I knew right then that getting really good was all I really cared about. And putting myself out there was like, I'm not sure I care if that ever happens. And um, that didn't stay true for me. I reached a point where I wanted to put my work out there. Um, but the fact remains that I'm more comfortable with just, just messing around. This, this, by the way, is the drawing that I did in his class. And that's the little diagram of a nose that he did on my, on my paper. Um, he was, his work was so inspiring to me when I was in school. Speaking of school, these are some of the terrific artists and illustrators that I was exposed to while I was in the illustration program. It was actually a visual communication design program. Um, and um, the landmark that I want to mention here is one of my teachers, Robert Barrett, saying you can, you know, there, there, were, there were people in our program who like loved to draw horses or loved to draw flowers. And he was like, you can, you can get really good at drawing horses or you can get really good at drawing flowers. But if you just learn how to draw, then you can draw anything. And it gives me the chills repeating it because it, I knew it was true for me and I knew that was what I wanted. Another important teacher of mine is Sherry McGraw. Um, one thing she said is, we make painting so much harder than it has to be. We make it hard unnecessarily. Um, this is a Dean Cornwell painting um, that I've chosen to represent the entire visual communication design program and its message, which was every image is a design project. And that is something that I internalized so much that I, um, for a long time, I didn't even distinguish between different types of subject matter. Um, for me, like approaching a still life or um, a portrait or um, a landscape or anything was a design project. And I reached a point where I realized there are definitely some um, strategies that are more appropriate and work better for certain types of subject matter. But this idea that every, every image is a design project has, has been one of the most important ones for me. Um, John Singer Sargent, and this is just hearsay. He didn't say this to me directly and I'm, I've only heard it said that somebody asked him once what medium he was using and his answer was, my brain. Which is funny and completely true. You know, like, is there some magic medium that I can condition my paint with that will make the magic happen? And the answer is yes. Yes, you have a human brain. And one of the most miraculous developments in the universe. And that's what you're using to manipulate your paint. We're so lucky. Um, oh, so one more thing before I get to this slide. Things are reversed here. 
for me, I'm pointing the other way, this slide. Before I get to this slide, um, one other landmark on my journey was um, every art director ever, the message was um, in order to stand out, you have to have a recognizable style. And when I, like we were told that over and over and over in school, you have to develop a specific style. And this is one for me that I was like, no, that is not mine. I can't do that. I don't even, like, I don't, it doesn't resonate for me. I, mm -mm. And, and I'm not arguing with it as a, as a um, I'm not arguing with it. It's true, but I, it's not true for me. <laughs> So um, I think in the, this is one of the reasons I, I think I did not have a successful illustration career is that I didn't, I, I didn't put together a cohesive portfolio of like, here's the stuff that I do. This is what I'm marketing. And like, that's how you do it. And I never did that. Um, so now I want to talk about um, Tilly. This is Tilly. Her whole name is Tillamook Cheddar and, and she's an artist. That's her work above, that's her, her work. Um, one example, um, Tilly is a big inspiration. I should say was like she has, she has passed away, um, but she had a hugely successful art career. She had multiple um, solo and group shows in New York City. I think her career is much more successful than mine. And um, she is a big inspiration to me, primarily because I, what I imagine to be her attitude towards her art. And um, also in, an, in answering to the question, under what circumstances do I thrive? Under what circumstances do I create my work easily and beautifully? So, um, obviously she's not in charge of everything in her life, like the grocery shopping and, um, the laundry. Um, she had a manager who handled everything. Um, but most beautifully, I like to think of Tilly when I feel, um, intimidated or like I have to make a certain, you know, if I have certain ideas about how I want my painting to look, I just remember her and I think, Let's see what painting I do today. What's it gonna look like? Just show up, do my thing, and see how it turns out. Because I don't, I don't imagine that Tilly put a lot of rules on herself or constraints or demands about um, that she had to do it a certain way or like spent a long time um, wondering like which pigments to use or you know I feel like she was probably very immersed in her process and felt a great you know it's just something that she did she's a dog <laughs> uh. And then she would go like have her breakfast and then have her nap. <clears throat> so um, I am gonna take questions by the way, at the end I have like, um, just a few more minutes and then I'll be taking all the questions. Um, so this is the, um, this is the self portrait that I did in 2014. Um, at the time I felt an immense clear sense of who I was, not in a way that I could define verbally, but just in a sense of, I feel like I can stand here and look in the mirror and just paint myself easily. And I put the, I put in the key because, um, Keys unlock things. And I feel that for each of us, there is a key that can unlock parts of us that we haven't had access to before. Uh, 
Um, so, so my plein air work has encompassed a, a range of different things, always responding to what's happening in the moment, the different light. Um, I think what I've learned to do is to lean, lean towards what I love. I think that um, it is possible to adopt a style or to decide on some aspect of your own work that you want to settle on as a personal style. But I also feel that voice is a little bit different from style. And if there's a clarity in the inner world, then that voice can come through regardless of subject matter or light or outside stylistic expressions. So it will come through like, no matter what medium you're working in, no matter um, what your subject matter is, um, no matter which brush you chose that day. Like you, you can limit those things in a way to achieve some continuity aesthetically in the work that you're doing. Um, but your voice is something that no matter what song you're singing, your voice, people recognize it. This is something I painted one time the, in the woods near my house. Um, doesn't always have to be a glorious, backlit, glowing, still life. It just has to be something that catches my interest. <clears throat> so I, I, I mean, I chose this series of images just to show you sort of the range, because I feel like I'm almost uh, wildly inconsistent in my work. Um, But it's, it, the inconsistency is one of the things that, you know, it's the variety that's the spice of life. Uh, being able to solve things in different ways. It's, some, it's something that like keeps the process very alive for me. This one was a quick draw from Carmel, um, which, you know, remembering these quick draw, the first time I did a quick draw, I, I, Somebody had explained to me how it worked. You have two hours and then um, you turn in your work in a frame. And I was like, oh, that's weird. Like, how do you know what size frame you're gonna need? <laughs> um, but I didn't know was that a lot of people will go, like go out the day before and choose their quick draw spot. And then they go get their canvas stamp like an hour before. And then they go and they set up and then they watch their clock and they start painting right on the dot. Whereas I was like, uh, right on the dot, I was checking in, getting my canvas stamped, wandering around, wondering when inspiration was gonna strike me. I don't recommend that. Here's a little watercolor that I did in a sketchbook. Um, I may be disproving what, I'm, what my message is that voice comes through no matter how you approach it. These are over a long, long, long period of time. Um, but the, the, the freedom to experiment and the, um, the freedom to try different things and, and not having it be about success or failure, but just about discovery, I think is one of the greatest ways that we can find that inner freedom that allows our own voice to be unrestrained. <clears throat> and now I am open for questions. I think the way we're doing this is, Deb, you're going to read the read sure. them to me from the yes. chat. Yes, I'm going to moderate. Um, um, if Eileen can um, spotlight me again, I will be happy to. By the way, you got quite a lot of comments in here on you know the beauty of your work. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, and, and I think including the rat. I I enjoyed the rat a lot. That uh, sold so fast. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, but there are several questions that I had, but they are uh, many of them um, 
I'm sorry, I, I was uh, not visible. Um, uh, some of them uh, mirrored what I was going to ask you. So let me just uh, use the uh, questions in the chat uh, to okay. start us off. So uh, Mary Long asks, for a journey, we, we have to pack for a trip um, and you have to take essentials with you like you did on your bike trip. So what do you consider the essentials that you have to take with you for your journey as a, as a plein air painter? What are the essentials? For a plein air trip? You mean like the actual gear? No, I, I think we mean, no, I think we mean for your plein air journey, your personal, your personal. You mean, for, you mean for the inner world? For the inner world, I think she means. Yeah, okay. For your life as a plein air painter, yes. Yeah, it, it like, okay, so. The ability to center myself, the ability to mentally prepare for a painting, to know how, what, what type of mental process I have to approach the moment where I start a painting is really significant. Knowing, um, I mean, it, this kind of goes back to Tilly, Tillamook Cheddar. Like her manager did everything for her. Like he would, like her bed was ready all the time and clean and he would provide the food. Like you have to do those things for yourself so that you as an artist, when you arrive at the moment of the painting, all your other needs have been met. So you're completely happy. That's great. So another, another question, and I think this really goes to also to the heart of, of what you've been saying is, um, and, and I was thinking this as well, um, this idea of getting internal freedom versus restriction and what are the, the signs and symptoms of restriction being felt and how do you assess that in yourselves and what would you do, what kind of techniques uh, that you would use to get yourself out of those restrictions and into that space that's yeah, freedom. that's a very good question. So um, you know that you're experiencing restriction. You pretty much just, I mean, if you're really unhappy or feel stuck, if you're trying something and you're getting really frustrated or you um, are miserable. <laughs> and the answer is, is stop doing Stop working on what's frustrating you. Go do something that you can do easily and well. And it might not be painting. It might be, it might be, it might be like doing easy value scales or like just, just making marks or it might be gardening or it might be making soup, chopping vegetables. Do something that you can do easily and well until you feel good again. Then go back and pick up what you're trying to do. And, and so unhappiness is, you're telling us unhappiness is, uh, and frustration is, is often the sign that you're, you're restricting yourself. Does it happen? Well, I mean, I guess I feel like, I feel like, like recognizing when you're restricted is, I guess I feel like it's not that difficult. Like you, you feel restricted and that can express itself in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, another, another question is, um, do you make imprimatura toned ground for your artwork? If yes, how do you do it? More of a technical question. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, I work on a variety of surfaces and um, I, I do generally like to have a toned surface. Um, I actually have a video on my YouTube page that shows how I make my own panels and how I tone them. Um, my favorite canvas tone is this gorgeous golden sort of craft like paper bag color that I make out of um, old Holland raw umber and white. The, uh, another question uh, that has come up is where did you, um, where is your inner journey taking you now? Oh, well, my um, current, my big current project is I'm writing a book. 
on um, plein air techniques. And it's part of the um, Rockport Books for Artists series. And it will be, pub the, the projected publication date is um, April or May of 2023. And um, my inner journey is so excited about writing. Yeah, but you know, it's interesting. That's, you have a deadline and you have to produce a certain amount. Yeah. And, and so how does that square with, you know, and I think for a lot of us who've had careers in other fields and have gotten good at being, you know, productive and organized and on schedule to, to have this also at the same time, have this one, what you talked about wandering. And yes. Immersed. How, how do you square those two? Uh, it, with, it, with the writing process. Exactly. Like on the bike ride, like, you know, I know I have to get from point A to point B in a given day. And um, I get up early enough to do that. And then if I see something I want to stop and put in my sketchbook, then I do. And if I want to like go a couple streets over and explore over there, then I do. But I still know what time it is. And I still know where point B is and how far away. That's a good, that's a very helpful tip because that I, I think that a lot of us struggle with that, um, you know, getting too, too involved in the production aspects. And, and well, too, and I think that with painting, what I see a lot is that people are just like point B, point B, like it's all about point B and it, it just can't be all about finishing. You know, you, you have to develop a, a broad comfort level with unfinished paintings in order to be comfortable with the process because it's it's unfinished for 99 percent of the time until you put the last brush stroke on then it's finished you you can't wait to be comfortable until you put that last brush stroke on you need you need the entire process to to be to be alive and comfortable but in the competition world is that how does that work with that because there is that deadline there is that pressure there is that you must produce within a certain period of time how do you how do you keep yourself from you know getting caught up in that um like mentally you, you you have to like the way i do that in in that world is i i just do it like i just i have my own i have my own sphere where it's like it's big enough that i can accommodate what i need to do within that system but I'm also like just finding my own, my own space. Great. Um, there's a couple other questions that have come okay. in. Um, some of us uh, won't have the opportunity to study in some of the places that you've studied, like New York League or Florence. How, what do you recommend we do to be good, get good? You know, the, the, the first part of the um, equation. Well, the, the, for the most important thing you can do to become a famous artist is be born in France. <laughs> so, and the second thing you can do is to buy my book <laughs> when it comes out. Uh, no, uh, honestly, um, I, th there are so many opportunities now um, online. Like, so there's so much good instruction online that, uh, and, and, I think all you need to do is like look for the things that you love and find a way to align yourself with them more closely. Like if there's an instructor whose work you just think is like, you've just feel it shredding at your heart every time you look at it, go that direction. It, it has something for you. And, and uh, you um, are associated or with Winslow Arts Center, correct? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so is that a, are there opportunities? Can you tell us a little bit about the opportunities there? At Winslow Art Center? Yeah, they, um, so they have a terrific website and um, a lot of really, really good instructors and all kinds of subject matter and um, a really great online um, interface. So um, yeah, some of the people in the, audience here today are have taken a lot of classes there it's it's a it's a terrific school I would su just suggest like browsing their website and looking at what the upcoming classes are and um I'm teaching one coming up in April April and May 
And then this fall, I'm going to be teaching the backlit still life um, as an extended class. So there, there are lots to choose from. Excellent. Excellent. And there, you're getting, there's a lot of comments in the chat about the courses there being great and having found you there, actually. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. And, and there was a, one more technical question that I don't want to overlook. Um, mm -hmm. Just a real basic one. How do you pick a scene at plein air? How, do, how does that, what is your process for deciding what you're going to do for a plein air when you're plein air painting? Well, at an event. Um, I think I they're saying either way, either at an event or just when you're painting plein air. Right. Art. Well, the best thing is if it has a red umbrella, because red umbrellas always sell. <laughs> also, chickens and dogs. If you put a chicken in or a dog in, your painting will sell. Um, the, the way that I pick is it's very design-based. Like, I'm always looking for a composition that I like. Um, I just walk around and, like, see if I can find something that I like. And if, if, if time is of the essence, I will look, I will usually look for something backlit because I know um, I love to paint backlighting as a phenomenon. And um, for example, this painting right here, backlighting, um, not a plein air piece, but it's based on a plein air piece. Um, So yeah, it just looks for some, I just look for something that resonates for me. And I uh, personally took a note down about red umbrellas, chickens, and dogs. Just, yeah. Just wanted, I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. Oh, also uh, clinking wine glasses. Clink. Okay. Wine clinking glass. wine glasses. People will like fall all over themselves to buy that painting. That's great. I've never done it. My friend <laughs> Wayne McKenzie paints clinking wine glasses and jokes about how like you can't keep them on the easel. <laughs> but this is what I'm talking about between like where the inner world and the outer world like clash, you know, like you don't really want to get into a position. That's why it's a joke that where you're like painting stuff that you know is going to sell because then like wh where did your de decision making process go, you know? Right. No, so, but when you, when you get a lot of exposure to that commercial world, it does have an effect on your thought process. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a balance. So are you in galleries, I assume, as well? And, and does that influence um, some of your internal decision-making process, the being in the galleries, being commercial? Um, how important is that to you? Um, I, I, I still paint whatever I want. Um, I'm in, I'm, I am in, galleries yeah I send them what I paint they sometimes ask me for stuff specifically um and I'm just like ha 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 that's not how it works right. <laughs> and, how, and, how do you, and how do you feel about commissions yeah I've done lots of commissions mm -hmm. and does that in, does that influence I actually we're at time I'm sorry I opened a whole new a whole new door. oh yeah no yeah. I read the notes about sticking to the schedule Deb <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we're but we're doing fantastically and uh, yeah. I think this has been a fantastic conversation and well it's great if there are any about. other um questions that come through in the chat I I'll just I'll just go through there and type in some responses enjoyed it